So today, we're going to look at the state of the church. This is the second part of Laodicea, but we will not really be talking about Laodicea. Uh, we talked about Laodicea last week. And if I could get you to hand these out. This is a, well, let, me, let me look at it. Let me, let me make sure it's correct. Oh, that's the evangelist board. No, that's, I don't know where Martha put them. Uh-oh. Are they maybe on the bar out there, that bar area? I don't know. What do you need? Martha had printed out some things and said she was putting them in the class. Uh, I had sent her some things to print out. Maybe, hold on, maybe she put them all. No, yeah. that's all stapled. No, that's. Hmm. Okay. Okay. She, I think she is. I don't know exactly where she is. Yeah. She teaches uh, in this class. She's okay. Down that long can can you go, Linda, and ask her? What am I asking for? Ask her where the stuff is she printed out for me. <laughs> stuff. Stuff. <laughs> you know what? It might be, and it's going to be the summaries of the churches. Look in where the Sunday school rosters oh, are and that, everything. That it might be there. Matter of fact, I bet that's what she did. Okay, so we're going to look at the state of the church. And we get some prophetic insight on what the church will look like in the last days, which I believe we're in the last days, whether or not it's the last year, the last week, the last decade, or the last century, I don't know. I have no clue. Um, but, I, you know, from looking at the prophecies that we're going to study in Revelation, I think we're sooner than, uh, than, than, you know, we might even think. So, we get some ideas about what the church will look like from 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy. And, of course, looking at Laodicea. Now, why do you think Paul would write these things to Timothy and, and put them in 1st and 2nd Timothy. Why do you think? What's your speculation on it? What are, what are the book, what are the books of, don't say it, you're seminary, you better, you better know the answer. You better know the answer. If you don't know the answer, you're in trouble. 1st and 2nd Timothy and the book of Titus are known as the Okay, Andrew. I'm not certain. I don't know. Well, I got an idea, but I don't know if it's right. I'm make you do push-ups. <laughs> <laughs> pastoral epistles. Okay, that is what those three books are called: the pastoral epistles. And what they are is guidebooks for pastors. If you're going to be in the ministry, pastoral, or whether you're an elder, or, uh, an overseer, you know, deacon, you need to have these books memorized. They are extremely important. And what you will notice in these books is Paul spends an exorbitant amount of space on the end times, on the last days. Considering that they're pastoral epistles, and you would think that that should be his focus, is this is what you need to be to be a pastor. He spends a lot of focus on the church and the end times, and what's going to happen, and what the church is going to become. And a lot of that is because Paul wants us to avoid those things. So as we look at this, we're going to see that, uh, that the church of the first century is not going to be the church of the last century. So here is the first uh, verse in 1 Timothy 4. Now the Spirit expressingly says, so the Spirit doesn't just casually say, the Spirit doesn't just kind of toss it out there expressly. He's, in other words, he's fervent that some will depart from the faith by devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and the teachings of demons. Now, we talked about this several weeks ago. What is all paganism? All pagans worship what? Idols. Idols, but what are idols? They're false gods, and what are false gods? Demons. Remember that we saw that in from Moses, and we saw it in the New Testament from Paul. We know that everything they offer, they're offering to demons. 
Every false doctrine. Oh, awesome, thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Every false doctrine is, is got its origins in hell. So, the faith is the Christian faith. They're departing from the Christian faith. They're departing from faith in Christ. So we know that there will be apostasy. Now, I want to look at this word. Okay, this is what it means to depart. Ephistomy. It means to remove. Now, this, uh, this is what I thought was the most interesting definition of it. And if you get on your east sword and you look, this actually is Thayer's Greek definition. To instigate a revolt. So, if you were revolting against the government, this is the Greek word that they would use on you. Is that you were revolting. So what you're doing is revolting from the faith. And it's not just you doing it. We can revolt, like, we can rebel against our parents. Right? When we were kids, right? We rebelled against our parents. Some of us more than others. Some of us were goody-two-shoes. Oh, stop that. <laughs> My perfect child. Hey, I was a good girl. You are a good girl when you met me. But what this means is it instigates. They're the instigators. They're not just, you know what, I'm not going to go to church. I don't believe all that. They're actually vocally telling people, yeah, I was in the faith, and I'm leaving it, and you should leave it too. We have a lot of that going on. And, or what they do is they depart from the faith, not necessarily departing from renouncing Christianity, but they seek to change it. Okay? Do we see some of that going on today? Yes. Seeking some, some change? Hey. hey, look who's here. Come on in, sister. She's not my oldest friend, but she's pretty darn close. <laughs> I don't mean that you're old. I mean in terms of relation. <laughs> you're bad. Okay, so we know that people are going to depart from the faith. They're going to instigate revolts, and they're going to devote themselves to the doctrines of demons. They're not just going to follow some doctrine. They're going to devote themselves. Now, as we look at same-sex marriage, as we look at uh, those who are seeking to fundamentally change Christian orthodoxy, not just with the same-sex marriage, I'm talking uh, who Jesus is, who Satan is, what this Bible is. Because let me tell you, when you start to take out pieces of the Word of God, what you've done is now given me permission to take out the pieces of the Word of God I don't like. Because if you can do it, I can do it right. And so now what we're left with is 7 billion different versions of what this is. As if your opinion really matters. It doesn't. My opinion on what this Bible is, it doesn't matter. God could care two hoots about what I think about his word. As far as my opinion mattering. Okay? He cares what I think about it, but I better align myself to him. So they're going to devote themselves to the doctrines of demons. 2 Timothy 3 1. But understand this, in the last days there will become there will come times of difficulty. Now, as we go through this, uh, I want us to take a real hard look at the church. This church, and that is what these handouts are. Mm -hmm. Because you will see at the end of this class, I'm going to give you guys an assignment. These are the summaries of all of those things that we talked about over the last seven weeks. This is their summary. Okay, You can look at what did Jesus say? What were all the titles of Jesus? Well, they're all on one page. What were all the commendations? They're all on one page. What are all the condemnations? They're all on one page. What's all the pieces of advice? How does it apply to you? How does it apply to the church? It's all summarized there. Because remember, there's seven, or, there's seven different things in these letters to the, to the, in the churches of Revelation 2, Revelation 2 and 3, there's all of these different common attributes to each letter. We got a name. We got a title that Jesus gave himself. 
well, you know, we've got a commendation, we've got a condemnation, we've got, you know, we've got some advice, uh, and, and we've also got, you know, he who has an ear, let him hear, and then we've got, you know, a promise, and we've also got the prophetic fulfillment of that church over history. And so, you know, I, I remember a couple of years ago, I think it was, or a year ago, there was some, there was some things going around on Facebook that were like, you know, this is the problem with the church today. This is what the church has got issues with. And I remember, I can't remember, this threat, it wasn't just like on my page, it was on, you know, you know, it's one of those things that had been liked by 250,000 people and had a half a million comments or whatever. And I remember reading one of the comments that said, you know, I'm tired of people picking on God's church. They shouldn't be doing that. This is the bride of Christ. You need to stop talking bad about her. Well, I, I didn't say anything about that, but I totally disagreed with it. And let me tell you why. Because we just studied for seven weeks where Jesus Christ himself picked on the church. And we just learned that there were two churches he had not one good thing to say about. And we just learned that a church of Laodicea, what was the implication there for the church and for you? To take a real good, honest look at yourself. And so when those articles come out about, hey, this is what the church is doing wrong, if they're scriptural, they're valid. Because we have to take a real good look at ourselves. Not only ourselves as a Christian, but as, as our churches. Where are we? And that's the reason why those letters are so important. Chapters 2 and chapter 3 of Revelation are the most important chapters. It's really important to know this other stuff. But getting those two chapters are key. To a, a healthy church and a healthy Christian life. Well, we see that what happens in the Laodicean era, which we said was about 1900 to the present, what happened in the Laodicean era is uh, what we see in 2 Timothy 3. Perilous times are coming. And that perilous time, that, the word perilous is kleplos. It means it's hard to take. There are times coming that are going to be hard to take as a Christian. Uh, they're hard to bear, they're troublesome, they're dangerous, they're harsh, they're fierce, they're savage. So that's the idea of that Greek word there, kalepos. That in the last days, tough times are coming for you as a Christian and for the church. Remember, who's Paul talking to in this epistle? He's talking to a pastor. Okay. And he, he actually not talking to a pastor per se like we would think of the pastor. He's actually talking to an elder, a bishop, an overseer who's probably overseeing hundreds because the church of Ephesus had tens of thousands of people in it by the time Paul wrote this letter. And so you had probably a thousand house churches going and each one of those house churches had a pastor. So he's not just a pastor. He is like a, what well, in some instances, like a bishop. He's the overseer of all of it, even though he's working with a group of godly men. <laughs> So, who's Paul talking about? I want to add, many times when we hear this message preached, and you might watch prophecy shows. I know David watches a lot of prophecy shows. They have a tendency to say that this is what the world's going to look like in the last days. Uh, and many of you probably heard that, that when you read 2 Timothy 3, well, that's the world. That's why we're living in perilous times, because this is what the world's going to look like. Well, I'm going to propose that that is not what is being said. As a matter of fact, I'm not going to propose it. I'm going to tell you that that's not what's being said. That is a misunderstanding of the scripture. If you think that, that's, that Paul in the first nine verses of chapter 3 is describing the world, you're wrong. Let me explain. Let me. It's the church. Exactly right. He's speaking about the church. Because mm -hmm. we know some background. Remember what we talked about the very first class. Everything's in context, right? When we read the scripture, we don't just take the first verse and the second verse of 2 Timothy 3 in isolation. <clears throat> because first of all, there were no chapters. There were no verses. When Paul wrote that letter to Timothy, it was just a letter. Now, when I got love letters from Vanessa, I don't know about you guys, when you got love letters from your wife, when y'all were, you know, courting or whatever, did you take it and break it down in chapters and verses? Did you sit there and draw, okay, this is a one, paragraph one, I'll call that chapter one, and then each sentence I'm up. I didn't do that. I read it. <laughs> and then I read it again. Okay, because, you know, this was when she used to write me letters, this was when you didn't have cell phones and, you know, it was expensive to call. And I was in another state. And 
And she would write me these real long, beautiful 12, 15, 20 page letters. Sometimes on the saran wrap. Sometimes in saran wrap and yeah. <laughs> And I'd get all homesick. <laughs> so, in context, Timothy is being told by Paul, in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but of wood and clay. In a great house. The context is what he's talking about here is the church. Not the church at Rosharon. Not the church at Ephesus. The universal church. Okay? He's talking about the church. And in this great house that we call the church, there are vessels of gold and silver. There's good stuff, but there's also bad stuff. Some stuff is for honorable use and some is for dishonorable use. Have you been in some churches that seem to have some dishonorable uses? Yes. Okay? Yeah. If anyone cleanses himself from what is dishonorable, he will be a vessel for honorable use. To set apart as holy, useful to the master of the house. Now, who do you think he's talking about here? Us. No, you, the master of the house. The Lord, right, the Lord. Okay, he's going to be useful to the Lord, ready for every good work. Because he's set apart as holy, he's honorable, he's useful. So Paul is already laying the groundwork here that there's something about the church that can be dishonored. And what he, taught, he, he goes, therefore, into great detail. Because he calls them unholy. So here are some... Uh, here's some some things that he talks about here. Uh, he calls them unholy. Now, to your knowledge, has the world ever been holy? No, it's not holy. So therefore, is it, would it be a real startling revelation to say that, hey, the world's going to become unholy? You know, that's kind of being like, you know what, I know what you think today, but tomorrow a circle will be round. Y'all don't, don't get all freaked out about it. And Pluto won't be a planet. And Pluto won't be a planet. All right? Yes, it is. It always will be. Yes. Neil Grass Tyson, he can, whatever. Don't get me started. So they're going to have a, here, they have an appearance of godliness. Has the world ever had an appearance of godliness? The world? No. Does the world really care about learning and arriving at a knowledge of the truth? No. They reject truth. It's ignorance to them. It's foolishness. And just as Jonas and Jambres opposed Moses, so these men also opposed the truth. Now, it doesn't say they opposed. Now, it says they opposed the truth. What's the truth? What's the gospel truth? Jesus Christ and Him crucified. That's the truth. So we can see that Paul here in these clues of what we're going to study today, in these little clues here, he's telling you that what is going on here is the church. Because it's not a shock if the world is all of these things. And we've got 28, I think 28 things I'm going to list here. And we're not going to dwell on but about three of them. But of these 28 characteristics, it is not a shock that the world has them. Because guess what? The world had them before Paul wrote it. The world was describing it, you know, showing their character when Paul wrote it. The world has not changed. They're still unholy. There's still all of these things. But the shock is that the church was going to become these things. And as we go through them, I think you're going to be able to go, wow, that's accurate. And that has changed in my lifetime. It's changed in my lifetime. I have seen it in the church. Go from this to that. Who was Jonas and Jambres? Exactly. Exodus 7. Moses and Aaron, remember, they went before Pharaoh and they did these mighty works. The first thing they did was Aaron threw his rod down and turned it into a serpent. Well, John's and Jambres. Now, this is the, the Jewish, uh, the names of these magicians according to Jewish tradition. They're not in the scripture, but according to Jewish Talmudic tradition, these are the guys. That was their names. So they threw a snake down, we threw a snake down. Okay. Moses turns the water to blood. What did they do? Turn the water to blood. So what are they doing? Copy. Copy. They're counterfeit. Mm -hmm. And so that is what Paul is saying. How did they oppose, how did they oppose Moses? They produce counterfeits. Mm -hmm. So we got to think now in the context that this is talking about the church, that there are going to be people in the last days that produce counterfeits. 
And they might even produce counterfeit signs and wonders. It is no marvel because Satan is an angel of? Well, he's a deceit, but what is he now? Light. He's an angel of light. We, we have this image, and I think Satan did it. I really do. I really believe Satan did this, okay? He made himself into an image of a little red devil with a uh, with hooves and a horns and a pitchfork and a tail. You need to understand that Satan is still the same being he was when he walked in the garden. He is still the same being that we see in Isaiah and Ezekiel described. He is an angel of light. God says you are adorned with every precious stone. And what that is a description of is how light is reflected. If you look at what color these stones are, it's exactly how light is reflected and refracted in a prism. He's also called the morning star. He's the morning star. That's what Lucifer means, the morning star. He is still that way. If you were to see Satan and not know it was Satan, you might think it might, was the most beautiful thing you had ever seen. Because he has not been changed. He doesn't get changed until what we're going to see in Revelation chapter 13, and, well, 12 and 13, when he gets cast down in Revelation 12. He is still in heaven, guys. He's, how do you think he went to God to accuse Job? He still has access. He go, All the sons of God came before him. And he, and he asked Lucifer, hey, where you been? I've been on the earth walking up and down on it. But now I'm here. And you got this guy down there. And God said, hey, if you look at Job, boy, he's a good guy. Satan goes, huh? He's only good because you protect him. That's what Satan's job is, but he's an angel of light. So counterfeits are going to be in the church. They're going to look good. They're going to sound good. But you know what? When you examine their doctrine, you're going to find out that they don't want to line up with this. This is your plumb line. Make us Amos 7. I've set before you. Is it Amos 7? I've set before you a plumb line, 714. Somebody look it up. I think it's Amos 714. I set before you a plumb line. This is the plumb line. Those of you who have worked as carpenters, you've done any carpentry work, you know what a plumb line is. I remember my dad hanging a plumb line from the ceiling, and I'd be like, what is that? And he goes, it's a plumb line. And I went to go touch. He's like, don't touch my plumb line. It's got to stop swinging. I'm like, what? What does that do? Well, it tells me exactly where up and down is. It tells me where truth is. And that's what the Word of God is. If it points to it, you know that's exactly where it is. Huh? Seven, seven. Seven, seven. Would you read it for me, Andrew? This is what he showed me. Behold, the Lord was standing beside a wall built with a plumb line, with a plumb line in his hand. And the Lord said to me, Amos, what do you see? And I said, a plumb line. Then the Lord said, Behold, I am setting a plumb line in the midst of the people of Israel. I will never again pass by them. The high places of Isaac shall be made desolate. The sanctuaries of Israel shall be, lit, shall be laid waste. And I will rise against the house of Jeroboam with the sword. Amen. Well, that's the reading of his word. And it's a plumb line. So that's what they do. If you exa examine them with the plumb line, you can tell their faith. So we know that, the, that what we're about to study is the church of the last days. Because those without Christ are already these things that we're going to study. So what it's saying is the people, some people... Maybe in some churches, a lot of people, because we have Laodicean churches out there, and it may be 90% of them. Or you may have churches where it's 10%, and that's going to be your task this week. Uh, but there's going to be some people in churches. And guess what? It don't matter what church you're in, there are these people. It just Even in the first century church, there were these people. Even in churches, guess what? In the Corinthian church that Paul founded, there were these people. That's the reason why he had to devote a whole chapter in 1 Corinthians 5, to saying, what are you guys doing? You morons, you knuckleheads. You've got a guy who's shacked up with his stepmom. You know, what are you doing? Because guess what? There's these people. <laughs> All right? So don't be shocked. But what Paul is saying here is it's going to be increasingly evident in the last days. You're not going to have one or two. You're going to have churches full of them. People will be. Now, I put a little asterisk here. So everything that people without Christ already are, you'll see that there's a whole bunch of these things that, well, why would Paul say that if it was a description of the world? Because they already are these things. So, so the people in the church will be lovers of self. We see that? Selfishness. Lovers of money. How many 
Do you think I can turn on um, the TV set right now and catch a preacher who can be, uh, who we might think is a lover of money? You know, and that's one of the qualifications in 1 Timothy 3. It's not greedy for filthy lucre. In other words, not, not greedy. Lovers of money. Proud. We got some proud people out there. I'm one. Okay? I'm a lot better than I used to be. She'll tell you. I mean, I'm a lot better. Believe me. You think I'm bad now? You should have seen me now. <laughs> <laughs> Arrogant. Ditto. Okay? Abusive. Not that. Uh, disobedient to their parents. Ungrateful. Do we have some ungrateful Christians out there today? I mean, let's, let's face it. You know, there's some people, my dad, my dad had a phrase for everything. He, and I, I, I keep saying that one, I know one day I'm going to write a book about all the little sayings of, that my dad had. Because I know I'm going to, and it's funny because they come to me over time, and this is one of them. He would always say, that boy is snake bit. And that was his phrase for that poor kid. They, nothing ever happens good to them. They're just snake bit. They just, you know. Well, we have to understand as Christians that even if we live a snake bit life, that it's God's mercy and provision somehow, and he knows what's, what's happening if we're trusting in him. Unholy. This is what we talked about. Is the world unholy already? Uh, yeah. yeah. But what, so that's not a shock. Uh, but what Paul is saying, hey, there are going to be some unholy people in the church. Heartless. Heartless. That hurts. Unappeasable. You can't satisfy them. Slanderous. Without self-control. Wow. Brutal. Not loving good. You know, the world never has loved good. There's been good people in the world, but by and large, the world, they are not lovers of good. Treacherous. Reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure, not lovers of God. Now, if you would look at the first century when Paul wrote this, they were full of lovers of pleasure. None of them loved God outside of the church, outside of Christ. They all loved themselves. They say they worshiped gods, but they got pleasure from worshiping those gods. You know, they would go to their temples and make sacrifices with a prostitute. Now, if you're in the world, guys, that's not a huge sacrifice. I'm sorry, that's blunt, but that's the truth. Oh, yeah, torture me. If I'm, if I'm without Christ and I'm living in the world, oh, I've got to go to the temple and have sex with a prostitute. That is not the church. That's, that's, that's the world. Lovers of pleasure, not lovers of God. So the world's never loved God. That's the reason why you had to come out of the world and come to Christ. Because you were lovers of pleasure. And now you were lovers of God. They had a form of godliness. Now, this is not the world. In other words, they have an appearance of godliness. They look like they're holy. They look like they're godly. But they're all of these other things, really. You know people like that? I've known some people like that. They deny the power of God. Now, what is the power of God? It's, a power. it's in the Holy Bible. Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit. They deny the power of God to change people's lives. And they deny, and, and sickly, the dunamis is the Greek word here, the dynamic power of God. They, they may say they believe in healing. They may say they believe in these things. They miracles. may say they believe in miracles. But deep down, eh, not really. Let me tell you something. When I taught on demons many Sunday nights ago, uh, last even like maybe earlier this year when I taught on demon possession, I, I saw the looks. I did. I saw the people and the gasp and the, uh -huh. okay? And I, you know what I always say about that? I always try, I strike it funny. It, it, it really strikes me funny, I should say, that people will I know you did. It, it always strikes me funny that people will say, I believe everything in this, including the stories where Jesus cast out demons. And that if we had a missionary come from, from uh, Africa or from South America or from some foreign land, and they said, yeah, they cast out demons, we would believe them. Wow. They would say, wow, that's great. It happens all the time. Yeah, because and we hear those stories from the missionaries. Hold on one second, Herm. But if it happens in Rocheron, we don't believe it. 
Now, you've got to think about that. If you mock that, that's what you're saying. That, that God's power doesn't necessarily work here. Or maybe the devil doesn't work in Rosharon. Maybe he has, is the devil set up camp in Rosharon? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Brother Harmon. I got to get this off the chair. I can't even handle it much longer. <laughs> I didn't do something to you, did I? Who cares, mate? This is the power of God and the salvation of the Word. Now, who is the Word? Jesus Christ. All right. In the beginning was the Word. That's right. That is right. So, what we see is they depart from the faith. We see this. We see that. That's good. We see it in 1 Timothy 4 1. We now see that they're going to depart from the faith and they're going to devote themselves to deceitful spirits and teachings of demons. They will not endure sound teaching. There are a lot of people out there. There are churches full of people because you know why? They don't want to endure sound teaching. They want to keep to themselves because they have itching ears. So they're going to accumulate themselves teachers to suit their own passions. There are churches full of these people. Don't dare teach about sin. Don't dare teach their need of a the Savior. We only put God as a God of love. We don't understand that His wrath resides on those who do not know Him and reject Him. His wrath. That's John 3.36. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. But whoever does not believe in the Son, the wrath of God. Resides on, remains on him, not will come on him. In other words, it's parked there and it ain't moving. So, what they're going to do is in the last days, we're going to see they're going to turn away from listening to the truth and they're going to wander off into myths. They're going to wander off into things that really aren't important. So, it is apostasy, it's, it's part of it. So, let's look at just a couple of these things. Lovers of self. And let's see if this doesn't strike us in our heart. It does to me. It really does. And to God. When I read this passage, every time I go through the book of Acts, I think, wow, I wish I was here. And I would love to see this. And you know what? I know in, in the churches, in the persecuted churches in like the Sudan and in, in, in China and in the Middle East, this verse is going on in spades right now. They, this is their life. All who believed were together and had all things in common. They were all selling their possessions and belongings, distributing for need, receives to all as any had need. That's what the church looks like. Believe it or not, it's kind of communism. And we as Americans think, oh, that's just terrible. No. When done in Christian love, that's the way Jesus wants it to be. But see, the problem with communism is it's not, it's not done in Christian love, and so therefore it's corrupted and it benefits the few at the sacrifice of everybody else. But when it's guided by the Holy Spirit, see, we don't love ourselves. And when we love it, when I say love ourselves, I'm not, I, I, it doesn't just mean I'm, I, I like, I'm proud of myself. I love myself. It means I love everything I got. Okay. So when we're Christians, we're, we're truly giving. Now, we can't enable. Okay? We cannot enable sin. We can't just give, give blindly. But when it is a just cause and you know the, the money or the time or whatever you're doing is going to further God's kingdom for a true brother or sister, Amen. this is what you got to do. Okay? Without self-control, 1 Corinthians 9, 26 and 7, therefore I run away from such a thing. This is Paul. This is, we're going to see that the church in the last days that people don't have self-control. This is the kind of self-control that Paul is telling you to have. I box in such a way, not as beating in the air. So in other words, he says, I'm not shadow boxing. And I always think, you know, it's funny that shadow boxing was going on 2,000 years ago. You know, that's something I see pictures of Muhammad Ali or Mike Tyson or, you know, I've really dated myself there because I don't, the boxing today stinks. But that's another story. <laughs> <laughs> so my buddy Shane Arno would like that because he agrees with that. Um, <clears throat> He says, I discipline my body. You know, the Christian life takes is a life of discipline. It is discipline to make yourself on some days read your Bible. Because let's face it, I have those days when I just don't. I don't feel like reading it when I first get up because I've got to get my faculties about me. And then things happen. You know, you know, all mayhem breaks loose in the house. And then I don't have the time. 
And it's discipline to make yourself read it during those times. And there are times when I don't discipline my body correctly. And I make my body my slave to do with what I want. See, that's what a slave is, a doulos. That's what Paul is saying. You must be a slave so that whatever your, your spirit tells your body to do, it does and is totally obedient. An appearance of godliness but denying its power. And we see this because in Isaiah 9.13. 9, because these people draw near me with their mouth and honor me with their lips while their hearts are far from me. And their fear of me is a commandment taught by men. That's traditions. In other words, your fear of the Lord, and we got whole, denom uh, whole religions based on this. Commandments taught by men. This is the only commandment that I need. Okay, if you have something that you want me to do, if it lines up with this, I'm golden. If it doesn't line up with this, then I'll take a look at it and go, is this necessary? Okay, will it fulfill the objectives in here? But if it's a tradition, I mean, let's face it, we as Baptists, we have traditions too. And some of them would think they're sacrosanct. They, they, the, you know, if you don't offer an invitation, uh-oh. Well, guess, y'all know how old the invitation tradition is? Go ahead. 200 years. 200 years. And not even really that. Uh, yeah, actually, Finney did it. Finney, in, right? Finney in 1820, 1830. Yeah. He would have this thing called the anxious seat. And he would offer an invitation. So in other words, Christianity for 1,800 years existed without an invitation. How did they survive? How did the churches grow if they didn't have a preacher standing down front with an invitation? Well, if they did it for 1,800 years. The Wesleys did it. Okay, Paul did it. Peter did it. Tradition. Now, is the invitation in itself bad? No. It's a tradition taught by men. So we have to be very careful when we're looking at doctrines of the church. Is this supported by Scripture or is this an addition by man? If it's an addition by man, does it, does it support the tradition of Scripture? Or is it there? can it be taken out? Any tradition of man can be taken out. And people shouldn't go into cardiac arrest over it. Okay, that's the whole point. I never know you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Those who have an appearance of godliness, they deny its power to change their life. They deny the working of the Spirit. That's, that's blasphemy of the Spirit. When you, when you basically tell the Holy Spirit he's, he's not in a, in a work. You deny the power of God. The power of God is the power of Christ and it's the power of the Holy Spirit to change your life. So, finally, we look at this. Uh, let no one deceive you in any way. For that day will not come unless a rebellion comes first and the man of lawlessness is revealed. That's the Antichrist, the son of destruction. Now, in the King James Version, that word rebellion is falling away. Okay? Now, there are numerous, and we will, as we look into the rapture, we will talk about this verse again because there are some theories on this verse that the, ver the word is mistranslated. I don't necessarily hold to those, uh, but we're going to discuss them in due diligence and fairness. Rebellion. It's apostasy. That's the real word. Apostasia. That's where we get the word apostasy. It comes from this, this word right here. Rebellion. It's a falling away. It's a defection. And so Paul is saying, let no one... Now this is in Thessalonians. So we have it now in 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, and, and we have it in Thessalonians, and we have it in Revelation. So this is a theme of Paul, that there is a rebellion in the Christian faith coming. No one to see me that day, the day of the Lord, because that's what in context what he's talking about is the coming of Christ, will not come unless a rebellion comes first. So there has to be a rebellion in the church and a wholesale rebellion. I think we're only seeing the tip of it. I really do. I want you guys to think quickly back 10 years and how Christianity has changed in just 10 years, people's opinions mm -hmm. about the Word of God. Yes, ma'am. Uh, well, I know when, you know, I'm going to go back a little further than 10 years, but I know whenever I attended church when I was a kid, um, there was this thing that said, you know, Jesus is coming back. Mm -hmm. And it was kind of 
with you know that now all we're hearing you know talking about is God and we're really not talking about that. Yeah, we don't talk about the flip side of the coin. Yes. And, and that's part of that whole thing is we don't discuss the wholeness of the gospel. You know, we only discuss a God of mercy. We don't discuss a God of wrath. We, okay. So let's just take a look at the state of theology. So who's that back on the earth Who's it being revealed to? It's being revealed to the world. Okay. But it also could be the church. And we're going to discuss those. Don't go ahead. <laughs> I gotta, I'm gonna make David, as we go forward, I'm gonna make David sit in the back of class and turn around that direction. <laughs> okay, so let's look at where we are. The state of theology. Now, this is a survey of evangelical Christians. This is not people in America. This is not the 70 something percent who say they're Christians, which we know that that's not true. This is evangelical Christians. And by evangelical, I'm not including Episcopalians, Catholics, Methodists, Protestants. They're not necessarily considered, not that they're not Christians, but they don't fall under the label of evangelical. Evangelicals are Southern Baptists, different Baptists, non-denominational types, okay, who do a lot of personal, believe or, or say they believe in a lot of personal evangelism. So of that survey, only 18% of the people said that the smallest sin deserves damnation. So in other words, there's a whole, there's 82% of the evangelical community who believes that there's small sins that don't need to be judged. So they have a misunderstanding of God's holiness and what your sin is. Only 60% believe Jesus was fully divine. 79% say that he's, the Holy Spirit is not an actual person of the Trinity. He's a force. My mother. Okay, God is more divine than Jesus. 56% believe, do not understand the Trinity and do not believe that there's co, three co-equal persons in the Trinity. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Only 47% believe that God actually wrote this book. Okay. Only 43% believe in the entire inerrancy of the Word of God, that this is accurate, this is what I need. Only 53% believe salvation is... This is evangelicals. Only half of the evangelical world. So what is it among Catholics? What is it among Presbyterians and Methodists and Episcopalians? You know it has to be much lower. Because they don't hear that. And I'm not saying, hey, we've got great Methodist friends that are Christians. And we know for a fact that they are believers in Christ. I've got Catholic friends that I know for a fact they're believers in Christ. But see, they don't hear this preached from their pulpits. <clears throat> and these are the people, 53% of the people are believing who will believe that, and they hear it preached from the pulpit. And 47% of them don't believe it. So does that mean they're not saved? I, I don't want to go there totally, but I would say probably. I would say probably because they have a misunderstanding of salvation. And when you deny the authority of God's word, that to me is a big, yeah. 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 Okay? Faith from the cross. That's right. Oh, uh, here, 41% believe that there are people in heaven who've never heard of Christ. More ways to heaven, this is the biggie. So Jesus is a spoke on the wheel. According to half of all evangelicals, Jesus is just another way. So I would say definitely here. Okay, because the fact of trusting in Christ means that I, a full trust is that there's him and no one else. It is not full trust if I believe I can trust this road, this bridge, or that bridge. Remember in Rosoria when they built a new bridge, it had two bridges going over. Which one did you want to drive over? <laughs> okay, the old rickety one that scared me to death every time I got on, especially if I got passing an 18-wheeler, or the new one? Y'all know what I'm talking about. If y'all drive over the Brazos River and there's those two bridges, heaven's sakes. Especially if it came on TV as the only other one like it in the nation. Yeah, <laughs> ready to go, you know, at any time. So that's... That's a no-go here. Satan is a literal being. Only 38% believe that he's a literal being. So, and I hate that we're running out of time. Uh, that is the state of the church. That is the state of evangelical Christianity. So in my mind, there's already been a falling away. There's already, we've already fallen away. When we have a misunderstanding of 82% of all evangelicals, that the smallest sin deserves to God's wrath. That even if you lived your life and you committed one sin, 
And it was, I stole a pencil from my teacher. That's a pretty minor thing we would say, right? But we have to understand that even that one sin, see, see, this is true faith, is understanding that even that one sin corrupts God's holiness mm -hmm. and deserves punishment. Yeah. And one of the biggest misnomers amongst people who call themselves Christian is the understanding is that you don't deserve heaven regardless of what you've done or not done. There's nothing good about you. That's the gospel. Mm -hmm. There is none good, no, not one. All have sinned and come short of God's glory. That's right. I think looking at it from the other direction, it's not so much about us in that sin, it's that we can't be in God's presence. That's exactly right. We corrupt God's holiness. If we put our even our little teaspoon of vinegar in his big bucket of milk, we corrupt it. It's no longer pure milk. It's milk with some vinegar in it. And you ain't never getting the vinegar out. So, the scripture for the week is preach the word. Be ready in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. Next week, very special week. Uh, let me give you that verse here. 2 Timothy 4.2 is the verse for those who are writing it down. 2 Timothy 4.2. And I'll have this in our notes. Next week, a very special week. If you're going to miss a week, next week is not the week. It is not the week. Matter of fact, invite some people. Because these tables are going to be gone. And we are going to celebrate Rosh Hashanah. Next Sunday is Rosh Hashanah. We have a soul week. Yeah. <laughs> this week, um, I've done a prayer walk through my neighborhood, and um, I'm hoping that there will be more people showing yes. up to attend church. Well, we would love it, and next week's a great week, because we're going to look at the feast and the fast very briefly, and then we as a class are going to celebrate Rosh Hashanah. I am going to attempt to make challah bread. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do it first. And then if I got it down, then I'll do it again. Otherwise, I'll drive to Houston and find a Jewish baker. <laughs> so for this week, this is what I need you to do. Read Leviticus 23. Read Leviticus 23. These are the feasts and the fasts of the Lord. And I believe I've got one more for you. And y'all bear with me one second. And then also read Zechariah. Write this down. Zechariah 14. Starting in verse 16 through the end of the chapter. Zechariah 14, verses 16 through 21. Zechariah 14, verses 16 through 21. Because we as the church in America... We don't celebrate these feasts and fasts anymore. But you need to understand, and what you will understand when you read Zechariah 14, is there is coming a day when you better celebrate it. There's not much written on that feast. Not much, but this the whole chapter 23, Leviticus 23 is all of it. Okay? And finally, I want you to rate yourself and your church using that outline. I want you to sit down and go, okay, this is where I feel I am. And be honest, remember that was a letter to Laodiceans. Take a good examination of yourself. So I'm going to be very transparent here. I examine myself and I feel that this is where I am. I'm about 50% Ephesian. I get caught up in the work of ministry, but I deny the passion of the Lord because I get so caught up in work. I'm about 10% Pergamos because I like to, you know, incorporate some things I shouldn't. I'm about 10% thigh tiring because I've got some worldly practices I need to get rid of. I'm about 10% Philadelphia because I'm really missionary oriented. I really love missions. But I'm also about 20% Laodicean. I'm somewhat self-deceived and I get focused on things. I think I've got this and I really don't. That's my honest assessment of who I am. I want you guys to do the same. And also, take a look at your... Take a look at your church. I want you, as you guys go to church right now, I want you to look at everyone around. From everybody from Chuck, okay, to Miss Gundy, and everyone else. 
I want to take everybody you see here on a Sunday morning. I want you to take an honest assessment, okay, of where you think we are as a church and what do we need to do to get to where we need to be. So let's pray real quick. Father, in the name of Jesus, we give you thanks for your word. We thank you that you are uh, a guiding star to us, Father, uh, and that your word is the plumb line. Father, we give you praise for it, and we thank you for your son, Jesus, whom without, Lord, we are lost in our sins, regardless of whether our sins are piled up to heaven or whether they just scratch a surface, Father. We're lost without our Savior, Jesus Christ, because of our sin. And Father, we thank you in Christ's name. Amen. Y'all have a blessed week.